Chapter Seven of Holiday House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. Holiday House by Catherine Sinclair. Chapter Seven: The Mad Bull. There's something in a noble boy, a brave, free-hearted, careless one, with his unchecked, unbidden joy, his dread of books and love of fun. And in his clear and ready smile, unshaded by a thought of guile, and repressed by sadness, which brings me to my childhood back, as if I trod its very track, and felt its very gladness. Willis one evening when harry and laura came down to dessert they were surprised to observe the two little plates usually intended for them turned upside down while uncle david pretended not to notice anything though he stole a glance to see what would happen next on lifting up these mysterious plates what did they see lying underneath but two letters with large red seals one directed to master harry graham and the other two, Miss Laura Graham. "'A letter for me?' cried Harry, in a tone of delighted astonishment, while he tore open the seal, and his hand shook with impatience, so that he could hardly unfold the paper. "'What can it be about? I like getting a letter very much. Is it from Papa? Did the postman bring it?' "'Yes, he did,' said Uncle David, "'and he left a message that you must pay a hundred pounds for it to-morrow.' very likely indeed said laura you should pay that for telling me such a fine story but my letter is worth more than a hundred pounds for it is inviting me to spend another delightful week at holiday house i am asked too and not mrs crabtree cried harry looking at his letter and almost screaming out for joy whilst he skipped about the room rubbing his hands together and ended by twirling laura round and round till they both fell prostrate on the floor if that be meant as a specimen of how you intend to behave at holiday house we had better send your apology at once observed lady harriet smiling lord rockville is very particular about never hearing any noise and the slamming of a door or even the creaking of a pair of unruly shoes would put him distracted yes added uncle david holiday house is as quiet as harry's drum with a hole in it if a pin drops in any part of the mansion lord rockville becomes annoyed and the very wasps scarcely dare to buzz at his window so loud as at any other person's you will feel quite fish out of waterish trying to be quiet and humdrum for a whole week so let me advise you not to go the meaning of advice always is something that one would rather wish not to do observed laura gravely i never in my life was advised to enjoy anything pleasant taking physic or learning lessons or staying at home are very often advised but never playing or having a holiday or amusing ourselves you know laura that harry's little shetland pony tom thumb in my field is of no use at present but kicks and capers and runs about all day yet presently he will be led out fastened to a rope and made to trot round and round in a circle day after day till he has no longer a will of his own that is education afterwards he shall have a bridle put in his mouth which some little girls would be much the better of also when he shall be carefully guided ever afterwards in the best ways and you likewise will go much more steadily for all the reining in and whipping you have got from mrs crabtree and me which may perhaps make you keep in the road of duty more easily hereafter uncle david said harry laughing we have read in the arabian nights about people being turned into animals but i never thought you would turn laura into a horse what shall we do with my little shetland pony if i go away next week i have thought of a capital plan for making tom thumb useful during the whole winter your grandmamma wants a watch-dog in the country so we shall build him a kennel put a chain around his neck and get some one to teach him to bark uncle david should be professor of nonsense at the university said lady harriet smiling 
but my dear children if you are allowed to pay this visit at holiday house i hope you will endeavour to behave creditably yes added major graham i understand that lord rockville wished to have some particularly quiet children there for a short time so he fixed upon harry and laura poor mistaken lord rockville but my good friends try not to break all his china ornaments the first day spare a few jars and teacups leave a pane of glass or two in the windows and throw none of your marbles at the mirrors i remember hearing said lady harriet that when miss pelham was married last year her old aunt mrs bouverie sent for her and said that as she could not afford to give baubles or trinkets she would give her a very valuable piece of advice and what do you think it was laura i have no idea do tell me then i shall bestow it on you as the old lady did on her niece be careful of china paper and string for they are all very transitory possessions in this world very true and most judicious observed major graham laughing i certainly know several persons who must have served an apprenticeship under that good lady many gentlemen now who dispatch all their epistles from the club because there the paper costs them nothing and a number of ladies who for the very same good reason never write letters till they are visiting in a country house having received so many warnings and injunctions about behaving well harry and laura became so quiet during the first few days at holiday house that they were like shadows flitting through the rooms going almost on tiptoe scarcely speaking above a whisper and observing that valuable rule for children to let themselves be seen but not heard lord rockville was quite charmed with such extreme good conduct for they were both in a special awe of him and thought it a great condescension if he even looked at them he was so tall so grand and so grave wearing a large powdered wig and silver spectacles which gave him a particularly venerable appearance though harry was one day very near getting into disgrace upon that subject his lordship had a habit of always carrying two pairs of spectacles in his pocket and often after thrusting one pair high on his forehead he forgot where they were and put the others on his nose which had such a droll appearance that the first time harry saw it he felt quite taken by surprise and burst into a fit of laughter upon which lord rockville gave him such a comical look of surprise and perplexity that harry's fit of laughing got worse and worse the more people know they are wrong and try to stop the more convulsive it becomes and the more difficult to look grave again so at last after repeated efforts to appear serious and composed harry started up and in his hurry to escape very nearly slammed the door behind him which would have given the last finish to his offences both the little visitors found lady rockville so extremely indulgent and kind that she seemed like another grandmamma therefore they gradually ventured to talk some of their own nonsense before her and even to try some of their old ways and frolicsome tricks which she seldom found any fault with except when harry one day eloped with lord rockville's favourite walking-stick to be used as a fishing-rod among the minnows with a long thread at the end for a line and a crooked pin to represent the hook while on the same day laura privately mounted the ass that gave lord rockville's ass's milk and rode it all round the park while he sat at home expecting his usual refreshing tumbler still they both passed muster for being very tolerable children and his lordship was heard once to say in a voice of great approbation that master and miss graham were so punctual at dinner and so perfectly quiet he really often forgot they were in the house indeed harry's complaisance on the day after he had laughed so injudiciously about the spectacles was quite unheard of as he felt anxious to make up for his misconduct and when lord rockville asked if he would like a fire in the playroom as the evening was chilly he answered very politely thank you my lord we are ready to think it hot or cold just as you please all this was too good to last one morning when harry and laura looked out of the window it was a most deplorably wet day the whole sky looked like a large grey cotton umbrella 
and the clouds were so low that Harry thought he could almost have touched them. In short, as Lord Rockville remarked, it rained cats and dogs, so his lordship knitted his brows and thrust his hands into his waistcoat pockets, walking up and down the room in a perfect fume of vexation, for he was so accustomed to be obeyed that it seemed rather a hardship when even the weather contradicted his wishes. To complete his vexation, as single misfortunes never come alone, his valet, when carelessly drying the morning post at a large kitchen fire, had set it in flames, so that all the wonderful news it contained became reduced to ashes. Therefore Lord Rockville might well have given notice that, for this day at least, he had a right to be in extremely bad humour. Lady Rockville privately recommended Harry and Laura to sit quietly down and play at Cat's Cradle, which accordingly they did, and when that became no longer endurable, some dominoes were produced. Thus the morning wore tediously away till about two o'clock, when suddenly the rain stopped, the sun burst forth with prodigious splendour, every leaf in the park glittered, as if it had been sprinkled with diamonds, and a hundred birds seemed singing a chorus of joy, while bees and butterflies fluttered at the windows and flew away rejoicing. Harry was the first to observe this delightful change, and with an exclamation of delight he sprang from his seat, pulled Laura from hers, upset the domino table, and rushed out of the room, slamming the door with a report like twenty cannons. Away they both flew to the forest, Laura swinging her bonnet in her hand, and Harry tossing his cap in the air, while Lord Rockville watched them angrily from the drawing-room window, saying, in a tone of extreme displeasure, "'That boy has a voice that might do for the town crier. He laughs so loud it is enough to crack every glass in the room. I wish he were condemned to pass a week in those American prisons where no one is allowed to speak.' In short, he would be better anywhere than here, for I might as well live with a hammer and tongs as with the two children together. They are more restless than the quicksilver figures from China, and I wish they were as quiet. But my only comfort is that, at any rate, they came home punctually to dinner at five. Nothing is so intolerable as people dropping in too late and disordering the table. Meantime, the woods at Holiday House rung with sounds of mirth and gaiety, while Harry scrambled up the trees like a squirrel and swung upon the branches, gathering walnuts and crab-apples for Laura, after which they both cut their names upon the bark of Lord Rockville's favourite beech, so that every person who passed that way must observe the large distinct letters. They were laughing and chatting over this exploit, both talking at once, as noisy and happy as possible, and expecting nothing particular to happen, when, all on a sudden, Laura turned pale, and grasped hold of Harry's arm, saying, in a low, frightened voice, "'Hush, Harry, hush! I hear a very strange noise. It sounds like some wild beast. What can that be?' Harry listened as if he had ten pair of ears, and nearly cracked his eyeballs staring round him to see what could be the matter." A curious deep growling sound might be heard at some distance, while there was the noise of something trampling heavily on the ground, and of branches breaking off the trees, as if some large creature was forcing his way through. Harry and Laura now stood like a couple of little statues, not daring to breathe. They felt so terrified. The noise grew louder and louder, while it gradually came nearer and nearer, till at length a large black bull burst into view, with his tail standing high in the air, while he tore up the ground with his horns, bellowing as loudly as he could roar, and galloping straight towards the place where they stood. Laura's knees tottered under her, and she instantly dropped on the ground with terror, feeling as if she would die the next minute of fright, while, as for attempting to escape, it never entered her head to think that possible. Harry felt quite differently, for he was a bold boy, not easily scared out of his senses, and instantly saw that something must be done, or they would both be lost. Many selfish people would have run away alone, without caring for the safety of any one but themselves, 
which was not at all the case with Harry, who thought first of his poor frightened companion. "'Hollo, Laura, are you hiding in a cart rut?' he exclaimed, pulling her hastily off the ground. "'The bull will soon find you there. Come, come, as fast as possible. We must have a race for it yet. That terrible beast can scarcely make his way through the trees and branches. They grow so closely. Perhaps we may get on as fast as he.' All this time Harry was dragging Laura along, and running himself into the thickest part of the plantation. But it was very difficult to make any progress, as she had become quite faint and bewildered with fright. "'Oh, Harry!' cried she, trembling all over. "'You must get on alone. I am so weak with terror. It is impossible to run a step farther.' "'Do not waste your breath with talking,' answered Harry, still pushing on at full speed. How can you suppose I would be so shabby as to make my escape without you? No, no, we must either both be caught or both get off. Laura felt so grateful to Harry when he said this that she seemed for a moment almost to forget the bull, which was still coming furiously on behind, while she now made a desperate exertion to run faster than she had been able to do before, clearing the ground almost as rapidly as Harry could have done though he still held her firmly by the hand to encourage her. The trampling noise continued, the breaking of branches, and the frightful bellowing of this dreadful animal, when at last Harry caught sight of a wooden paling, which he silently pointed out to Laura, being quite unable now to speak. Having rushed forward to it with almost frantic haste, Harry threw himself over the top, after which he helped Laura to squeeze herself through underneath when they proceeded rather more leisurely onwards. "'That fence will puzzle, Mr. Bull,' said Harry triumphantly, yet gasping for breath. "'We can push through places where his great hoof could scarcely be thrust. I saw him coming along with his heels in the air, and his head down, like an enormous wheelbarrow.' Scarcely had Harry spoken before the infuriated animal advanced at full gallop towards the fence, and after running along the side a little way, he suddenly tore up the paling with his horns, as if it had been made of paper, and rushed forward more rapidly than ever. Harry now began to fear that indeed all was over, for his strength had become nearly exhausted, when, to his great joy, he espied a large, rough stone wall not very far off, which was as welcome a sight as land to a shipwrecked sailor. "'Run for your life, Laura,' he cried, pointing it out to encourage her. "'There is safety if we reach it.' On they both flew, faster than the wind, and Harry, having scrambled up the wall like a grasshopper, pulled Laura up beside him, and there they both stood at last, encamped quite beyond the reach of danger, though the enemy arrived a few minutes afterwards, pawing the air and foaming and bellowing with disappointment. Laura, said Harry, after she had a little recovered from her fright, and was walking slowly homewards, while she cast an alarmed glance frequently behind, thinking she still heard the bull in pursuit. You see, as Uncle David says, whatever danger people are in, it is foolish to be quite in despair, but we should rather think what it is best to do, and do it directly. Yes, Harry, and I shall never forget that you would not forsake me, but risk your own life like a brave brother in my defense. I should like to do as much for you another time. Thank you, Laura, as much as if you had, but I hope we shall never be in such a scrape again. If Frank were here, he would put us both in mind to thank a merciful God for taking so much care of us and bringing us safely home. Yes, Harry, it is perhaps a good thing being in danger sometimes to remind us that we cannot be safe or happy an hour without God's care. So in our prayers tonight we must remember what has happened and return thanks very particularly. It was long past five before Harry and Laura reached Holiday House, where Lord Rockville met them at the drawing-room door, looking taller and grander and graver than ever, while Lady Rockville rose from her sofa and came up to them, saying, in a tone of gentle reproach, 
my dear children you ought to return home before the dinner hour and not keep his lordship waiting the very idea of lord rockville waiting dinner was too dreadful ever to have entered their heads till this minute but harry and laura immediately explained how exceedingly sorry they were for what had occurred and to show that it was their misfortune rather than their fault they told the whole frightful story of the mad bull to which lady rockville listened as if her very hair were standing upon end to hear of such doings she even turned up her eyes with astonishment to think what a wonderful escape they had made but his lordship frowned through his spectacles and leaned his chin upon his stick looking as harry thought very like a bear upon a pole pshaw nonsense exclaimed lord rockville impatiently the bull would have done you no harm he is a most respectable quiet well-disposed animal and brought an excellent character from his last place i never heard a complaint of him before it is curious observed laura that all bulls are reckoned peaceable and tame till they have tossed two or three people and killed them i thought added lord rockville looking very grand and contemptuous that harry was grown more a man than to be so easily put to flight when a bull another time threatens to toss you seize hold of his tail or toss him or in short do anything rather than run away the first time an animal looks at you this is a mere cock and a bull story to excuse your keeping me waiting almost a quarter of an hour for my dinner you should be made guard of a mail coach for a month to teach you punctuality master graham lord rockville gravely looked at his watch while harry luckily considered how often his grandmamma had recommended him to make no answer when he was scolded so he nearly bit off the tip of his tongue to keep it quiet while he could not but wish in his own mind that my lord himself saw how very fierce the bull had looked laura felt more vexed on harry's account than her own and the dinner went on as uncomfortably as possible for even when a french cook had dressed it if ill-humour be the sauce any dish becomes unpalatable nothing was to be seen reflected on the surface of many fine silver covers but very cross or very melancholy faces while lady rockville tried to make her own countenance look both cheerful and good-natured she told harry and laura to divert them that old mrs bouverie had once been pursued by a furious milk cow along a lane flanked on both sides by such very high walls that escape seemed impossible so the good lady who was fat and breathless became so desperate that without a hope of getting off she seized the enraged animal by the horns and screamed in its face till the cow herself became frightened the creature stared stepping backwards and backwards with increasing alarm till at last to the old lady's great relief and surprise she fairly turned her tail and ran off in the evening lord rockville had not yet recovered his equanimity and went out rather in bad humour to take his usual walk before supper without once remembering about harry and the bull he strolled a great way into the woods marking several trees to be cut down and admiring a fine forest which he had planted himself long ago but without particularly considering what way he turned it was beginning at last to grow very dark and gloomy so lord rockville had some thoughts of returning home when he became suddenly startled by hearing a loud roar not far off and a moment afterwards the furious bull dashed out of a neighbouring thicket raging and foaming and tearing the ground with his horns exactly as harry had described in the morning while poor lord rockville who seldom moved faster than a very dignified walk instantly quickened his pace in an opposite direction striding away faster and faster till at last it must be confessed his lordship ended by running in spite of all lord rockville's exertions the bull continued rapidly to gain upon him for his lordship being rather corpulent and easily fatigued stopped every now and then to gasp for breath till at last feeling it impossible to get on faster though the stables were now within sight he seized the branch of a large oak tree which swept nearly to the ground and contrived with great difficulty 
to scramble out of reach. The enraged bull gazed up into the tree and bellowed with fury, when he saw Lord Rockville so judiciously perched overhead, and he remained for half an hour watching to see if his lordship would venture down again. At last the tormenting animal began leisurely eating grass under the tree, but gradually he moved away, turning his back while he fed, till Lord Rockville vainly deluded himself with the hope of stealing off unobserved. Being somewhat rested and refreshed, while the enemy was looking in another direction, he descended cautiously, as if he had been going to tread upon needles and pins, but unaccustomed to such movements, he jumped so heavily upon the ground that the bull, hearing a noise, turned round and set up a loud furious roar, when he saw his intended victim again within reach. Now the race began once more with redoubled agility. The odds seemed greatly in favor of the bull, and Lord Rockville thought he already felt the animal's horns in his side, when a groom, who saw the party approaching, instantly seized a pitchfork and flew to the rescue of his master. Lord Rockville never stopped his career till he reached the stable, and ran up into a loft, from the window of which he gave the alarm and called for more assistance, when several ploughmen and stable boys assembled, who drove the animal with great difficulty into a stall, where he continued so ungovernable that iron chains were put round his neck, and some days afterwards, seeing no one could manage him, Lord Rockville ordered the bull to be shot, and his carcass turned into beef for the poor of the parish, who all consequently rejoiced at his demise, though the meat turned out so tough that it required their best teeth to eat it with. Meantime, on that memorable evening of so many adventures, Harry, Laura, and Lady Rockville wondered often what had become of his lordship, and at last, when supper appeared at the usual hour, his absence became still more unaccountable. "'What can be the matter?' exclaimed Lady Rockville anxiously. "'This is very odd. His lordship is as punctual as the postman in general, especially for supper.' and here is Lord Rockville's favourite dish of sago and wine, which will become uneatably cold in ten minutes if he does not return home to enjoy it. Scarcely had she finished speaking when the door opened and Lord Rockville walked majestically into the room. There was something so different from usual in his manner and appearance, however, that Harry and Laura exchanged looks of astonishment. His neckcloth was loose, his face excessively red, and his hand shook while he breathed so hard that he might have been heard at the porter's lodge. Lady Rockville gazed with amazement at all she saw, and then asked what he chose for supper. But when Lord Rockville tried to speak, the words died on his lips, so he could only point in silence to the sago and wine. "'What in all the world has happened to you this evening, my lord?' exclaimed Lady Rockville, unable to restrain her curiosity a moment longer. I never saw you in such a way before. Your eyes are perfectly bloodshot, your dress strangely disordered, and you seem so hot and so fatigued. Tell me, what is the matter? Nothing, answered Lord Rockville, drawing himself up, while he tried to look grander and graver than ever, though his lordship could not help panting for breath, putting his hands to his sides, and wiping his forehead with his pocket-handkerchief in an agony of fatigue. Harry observed all this for some time, as eagerly and intently as a cat watches a bird on a tree. He saw that something extraordinary had occurred, and he began to have hopes that it really was the very thing he wished, because, seeing Lord Rockville now perfectly safe, he would not have grudged him a pretty considerable fright from his friend the bull. At last, unable any longer to control his impatience, Harry started off his chair, gazing so earnestly at Lord Rockville that his eyes almost sprung out of their sockets, while he rubbed his hands with ecstasy, saying, I guess you've seen the bull. Oh, I am sure you did. Pray tell us if you have. Did he run after you, and did you run away? Lord Rockville tried more than he had ever done in his life to look grave, but it would not do. 
gradually his face relaxed into a smile till at last he burst into loud peals of laughter joined most heartily by harry laura and lady rockville nobody recovered any gravity during the rest of that evening for whenever they tried to think or talk quietly about anything else harry and laura were sure to burst forth again upon the subject and even after being safely stowed in their beds for the night they both laughed themselves to sleep at the idea of lord rockville himself having been obliged after all to run away from that most respectable quiet well-disposed animal the mad bull end of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Holiday House. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. Holiday House by Catherine Sinclair. Chapter Eight The Broken Key. First he moved his right leg, then he moved his left leg, then he said, I pardon beg, and sat upon his seat. Oh, Uncle David, Uncle David, cried Laura, when they arrived from Holiday House, I would jump out of the carriage window with joy to see you again, only the persons passing in the street might be surprised. Not at all, they are quite accustomed to see people jumping out of the windows with joy whenever I appear. "'We have so much to tell you,' exclaimed Harry and Laura, each seizing hold of a hand. "'We hardly know where to begin. "'Ladies and gentlemen, if you both talk at once, I must get a new pair of ears. "'So you have not been particularly miserable at Holiday House?' "'No, no, Uncle David. "'We did not think there had been so much happiness in the world,' answered Laura eagerly. The last two days we could do nothing but play and laugh and, and grow fat. Why, you both look so well fed. You are just fit for killing. I shall be obliged to shut you up two or three days without anything to eat, as is done to pet lap-dogs when they are getting corpulent and gouty. Then we shall be like bears living on our paws, replied Harry, and Uncle David. I would rather do that than be a glutton like Peter Gray. He went to a cheap shop lately, where old cheesecakes were sold at half price, and greedily devoured nearly a dozen, thinking that the dead flies scattered on the top were currants, till Frank shewed him his mistake. Frank should have let him eat in peace. There is no accounting for tastes. I once knew a lady who liked to swallow spiders. She used to crack and eat them with the greatest delight, whenever she could catch one oh what a horrid woman that is even worse than grandmama's story about dr manvers having dined on a dish of mice fried in crumbs of bread you know the old proverb harry one man's meat is another man's poison the persians are disgusted at our eating lobsters and the hindus think us scarcely fit to exist because we live on beef while we are equally amazed at the chinese for devouring dog pies and bird's nest soup you turn up your nose at the french for liking frogs and they think us ten times worse with our singed sheep's head oat cakes and haggis that reminds me said lady harriet that when charles x lived in what he called the dear canongate his majesty was heard to say that he tried every sort of scotch goose the solan goose the wild goose and the tame goose but the best goose of all was the hag goose very polite indeed to adopt our national taste so completely observed uncle david smiling when my regiment was quartered in spain an officer of ours a great epicure and not quite so complacent used to say that the country was scarcely fit to live in because there it is customary to dress almost every dish with sugar at last one day in a rage he ordered eggs to be brought up in their shells for dinner saying that is the only thing the cook cannot possibly spoil we played him a trick however which was very like what you would have done harry on a similar occasion 
I secretly put pounded sugar into the salt cellar, and when he tasted his first mouthful, you should have seen the look of fury with which he sprung off his seat, exclaiming, The barbarians eat sugar even with their eggs? That would be the country for me to travel in, said Harry. I could live in a barrel of sugar, and my little pony, Tom Thumb, would be happy to accompany me there, as he likes anything sweet. All animals are of the same opinion. I remember the famous rider Ducrow telling a brother officer of mine that the way in which he gains so much influence over his horses is merely by bribing them with sugar. They may be managed in that way like children, and are quite aware, if it be taken from them as a punishment, for being restive. Oh, those beautiful horses at De Crow's! How often I think of them since we were there! exclaimed Harry. They were quite like fairies, with fine arched necks and long tails. I never heard before of a fairy with a long tail, Master Harry, but perhaps in the course of your travels you may have seen such a thing. How I should like to ride upon Tom Thumb in Du Crow's way, with my toe on the saddle! Fine doings indeed, exclaimed Mrs. Crabtree, who had entered the room at this moment. Have you forgotten already, Master Harry, how many of the nursery plates you broke one day when I was out, in trying to copy that there foolish Indian juggler, who tossed his plates in the air and twirled them on his thumb? There must be no more such nonsense, for if once your neck is broke by a fall off Tom Thumb, no doctor that I know of can mend it again. Remember what a terrible tumble you had off Jessie last year. You are always speaking about that little overturn, Mrs. Crabtree, and it was not worth recollecting above a week. Did you never see a man thrown off his horse before? A man and horse, indeed, said Uncle David, laughing when he looked at Harry. You and your charger were hardly large enough then for a toy shop, and you must grow a little more, Captain Gulliver, before you will be fit for a dragoon regiment. Harry and Laura stayed very quietly at home for several weeks after their return from Holiday House, attending so busily to lessons that Uncle David said he felt much afraid they were going to be a pair of little wonders, who would die of too much learning. You will be taken ill of the multiplication table some day, and confined to bed with a violent fit of geography. Pray take care of yourselves, and do not devour above three books at once, said Major Graham one day, entering the room with a note in his hand. Here is an invitation that I suppose you are both too busy to accept, so perhaps I might as well send an apology, eh, Harry? Down dropped the lesson books upon the floor, and up sprung Harry in an ecstasy of delight. An invitation! Oh, I like an invitation so very much! Pray tell us all about it. Perhaps it is an invitation to spend a month with Dr. Lexicon. What would you say to that? They breakfast upon Latin grammars at school, and have a dish of real French verbs smothered in onions for dinner every day. But in downright earnest, Uncle David, where are we going? Must I tell you? Well, that good-natured old lady, Mrs. Darwin, intends taking a large party of children next week in her own carriage, to pass ten days at Ivy Lodge, a charming country house about twenty miles off, where you are all to enjoy perfect happiness. I wish I could be ground down into a little boy myself for the occasion. Poor good woman, what a life she will lead! There is only one little drawback to your delight that I am almost afraid to announce. What is that, Uncle David? asked Harry, looking as if nothing in nature could ever make him grave again. Are we to bite off our own noses before we return? Not exactly, but somebody is to be of the party who will do it for you. Mrs. Darwin has heard that there are certain children who become occasionally rather unmanageable. I cannot think who they can be, for it is certainly nobody we ever saw. So she has requested that Mrs. Crabtree will follow in the mail coach. Harry and Laura looked as if a glass of cold water had been thrown in their faces after this was mentioned, but they soon forgot every little vexation in a burst of joy when, some days afterwards, Mrs. Darwin stopped at the door to pick them up, in the most curious-looking carriage they had ever seen. 
it was a very large open car as round as a bird's nest and so perfectly crowded with children that nobody could have supposed any room left even for a doll but mrs darwin said that whatever number of people came in there was always accommodation for one more and this really proved to be the case for harry and laura soon elbowed their way into seats and set off waving their handkerchiefs to major graham who had helped to pack them in and who now stood smiling at the door as this very large vehicle was drawn by only one horse it proceeded very slowly but mrs darwin amused the children with several very diverting stories and gave them a grand luncheon in the carriage after which they threw what was left wrapped up in an old newspaper to some people breaking stones on the road feeling quite delighted to see the surprise and joy of the poor labourers when they opened the parcel in short everybody became sorry when this diverting journey was finished and they drove up at last to the gate of a tall old house that looked as if it had been built in the year one the walls were very thick and quite mouldy with age indeed the only wonder was that ivy lodge had still a roof upon its head for everything about it looked so tottering and decayed the very servants were all old and a white-headed butler opened the door who looked as frail and gloomy as the house but before long the old walls of ivy lodge rung and echoed again with sounds of mirth and joy it seemed to have been built on purpose for hide-and-seek there were rooms with invisible doors and closets cut in the walls and great old chests where people might have been buried alive for a year without being found out the gardens too were perfectly enchanting such arbors to take strawberries and cream in and such summer houses where they drank tea out of doors every evening here they saw a prodigious eagle fastened to the ground by a chain and looking the most dull melancholy creature in the world while harry wished the poor bird might be liberated and thought how delightful it would be to stand by and see him soaring away to his native skies yes with a large slice of raw meat in his beak said peter gray who was always thinking of eating i dare say he lives much better here than he would do killing his own mutton up in the clouds there or taking his chance of a dead horse on the seashore occasionally harry and peter were particularly amused with mrs darwin's curious collection of pets there were black swans with red bills swimming gracefully in a pond close to the window and ready to rush forward on the shortest notice for a morsel of bread the lop-eared rabbits also surprised them with their ears hanging down to the ground and they were interested to see a pair of carrier pigeons which could carry letters as well as the postman mrs darwin showed them tumbler pigeons too that performed a somerset in the air when they flew and horsemen and dragoon pigeons trumpeteers and pouters till peter gray at last begged to see the pigeons that made the pigeon pies and the cow that gave the buttermilk he was likewise very anxious for leave to bring his fishing rod into the drawing-room to try whether he could catch one of the beautiful goldfish that swam about in a large glass globe saying he thought it might perhaps be very good to eat at breakfast mrs darwin had a pet lamb that she was exceedingly fond of because it followed her everywhere and harry who was very fond of the little creature said he wished some plan could be invented to hinder its ever growing into a great fat vulgar sheep and he thought the white mice were old animals that had grown grey with years there were donkeys for the children to ride upon and mrs darwin had a boat that held the whole party to sail in round the pond and she hung up a swing that seemed to fly about as high as the house which they swung upon after which they were allowed to shake the fruit trees and to eat whatever came down about their ears so it very often rained apples and pears in the gardens at ivy lodge for peter seemed never to tire of that joke indeed the apple trees had a sad life of it as long as he remained peter told mrs darwin that he had a patent appetite which was always ready on every occasion but the good lady became so fond of stuffing the children at all hours that even he felt a little puzzled sometimes how to dispose of all she heaped upon his plate 
while both Harry and Laura, who were far from greedy, became perfectly wearied of hearing the gong. The whole party assembled at eight every morning to partake of porridge and buttermilk, after which at ten they breakfast with Mrs. Darwin on tea, muffins, and sweetmeats. Then they drove in the round open car to bathe in the sea, on their return from which luncheon was always ready, and after concluding that they might pass the interval till dinner among the fruit trees. They never could eat enough to please Mrs. Darwin at dinner. Tea followed on a most substantial plan. Their supper consisted of poached eggs, and the maid was desired to put a biscuit under every visitor's pillow, in case the young people should be hungry in the night, for Mrs. Darwin said she had been starved at school herself when she was a little girl, and wished nobody ever to suffer as she had done from hunger. The good lady was so anxious for everything to be exactly as the children liked it, that sometimes Laura felt quite at a loss what to say or do. One day, having cracked her eggshell at breakfast, Mrs. Darwin peeped anxiously over her shoulder, saying, "'I hope, my dear, your egg is all right. Most excellent, indeed. Is it quite fresh?' "'Perfectly. I dare say it was laid only a minute before it was boiled. "'I have seen the eggs much larger than that. "'Yes, but then I believe they are rather coarse. "'At least we think so, when Mrs. Crabtree gives us a turkey egg at dinner. "'If you prefer them small, perhaps you would like a guinea fowl's egg. "'Thank you, but this one is just as I like them. "'It looks rather overdone. "'If you think so, we could get another in a minute.' no they are better well boiled then probably it is not enough done some people like them quite hard and i could easily pop it into the slop basin for another minute i am really obliged to you but it could not be improved do you not take any more salt with your egg no i thank you a few more grains would improve it if you say so i dare say they will ah now i am afraid you have put in too much pray do get another this long continued attack upon her egg was too much for laura's gravity who appeared for some minutes to have a violent fit of coughing and ending in a burst of laughter after which she hastily finished all that remained of it and thus ended the discussion in the midst of all their happiness while the children thought that every succeeding day had no fault but being too short and harry even planned with peter to stop the clock altogether, and see whether time itself would not stand still, nobody ever thought for a moment of anything but joy, and yet a very sad and sudden distress awaited Mrs. Darwin. One forenoon she received a letter that seemed very hastily and awkwardly folded. The seal was all to one side, and surrounded with stray drops of red wax. The direction appeared sadly blotted and at the top was written in large letters the words to be delivered immediately when mrs darwin hurriedly tore open this very strange-looking letter she found that it came from her own housekeeper in town to announce the dreadful event that her sister lady burnet had been that day seized with an apoplectic fit and was thought to be at the point of death therefore it was hoped that Mrs. Darwin would not lose an hour in returning to town, that she might be present on the melancholy occasion. The shock of hearing this news was so very great that poor Mrs. Darwin could not speak about it, but after trying to compose herself for a few minutes, she went into the playroom and told the children that, for reasons she could not explain, they must get ready to return home in an hour, when the car would be at the door for their journey nothing could exceed their surprise on hearing mrs darwin make such an unexpected proposal at first peter gray thought she was speaking in jest and said he would prefer if she ordered out a balloon to travel in this morning but when it appeared that mrs darwin was really in earnest about their pleasant visit being over so soon harry's face grew perfectly red with passion while he said in a loud angry voice Grandmamma allowed me to stay here till Friday, and I was invited to stay, and I will not go anywhere else. Oh, fie, Master Harry, said Mrs. Crabtree, do not talk so. You ought to know better. I shall soon teach you, however, to do as you are bid. 
saying these words she stretched out her hand to seize violent hold of him but harry dipped down and escaped quickly opening the door he ran half in joke and half in earnest at full speed up two pairs of stairs followed closely by mrs crabtree who was now in a terrible rage especially when she saw what a piece of fun harry thought this fatiguing race a door happened to be standing wide open on the second landing-place which having been observed by harry he darted in and slammed it in mrs crabtree's face locking and double locking it to secure his own safety after which he sat down in this empty apartment to enjoy his victory in peace when people once begin to grow self-willed and rebellious it is impossible to guess where it will all end harry might have been easily led to do right at first if any one had reasoned with him and spoken kindly but now he really was in a sort of don't care a button humour and scarcely minded what he did next as long as mrs crabtree continued to scold and rave behind the door harry grew harder and harder but at length the good old lady mrs darwin herself arrived upstairs and represented how ungrateful he was not doing all in his power to please her when she had taken so much pains to make him happy this brought the little rebel round in a moment as he became quite sensible of his own misconduct and resolved immediately to submit accordingly harry tried to open the door but what is very easily done cannot sometimes be undone which turned out the case on this occasion as with all his exertions the key would not turn in the lock harry tried it first one way then another he twisted with his whole strength till his face became perfectly scarlet with the effort but in vain at last he put the poker through the handle of the key thinking this a very clever plan and quite sure to succeed but after a desperate struggle the unfortunate key broke in two so then nobody could possibly open the door after this provoking accident happened harry felt what a very bad boy he had been so he burst into tears and called through the keyhole to beg mrs darwin's pardon while mrs crabtree scolded him through the keyhole in return till harry shrunk away as if a cannonading had begun at his ear meantime mrs darwin hurried off racking her brains to think what had best be done to deliver the prisoner since no time could be lost or she might perhaps not get to town at all that night and the car was expected every minute to come round for the travellers the gardener said he thought it might be possible to find a few ladders which being tied one above another would perhaps reach as high as the window where harry had now appeared and by which he could easily scramble down so the servants made haste to fetch all they could find and to borrow all they could see till a great many were collected these they joined together very strongly with ropes but when it was at last reared against the wall to the great disappointment of mrs darwin the ladder appeared a yard and a half too short what was to be done the obliging gardener mounted to the very top of his ladder and harry leaned so far over the window he seemed in danger of falling out but still they did not reach one another so not a single person could guess what plan was to be tried next at length harry called out very loudly to the gardener hullo mr king of spades if i were to let myself drop very gently down from the window could you catch me in your arms mr harry mr harry if you dare cried mrs crabtree shaking her fist at him you'll be broken in pieces like a teapot you'll be made as flat as a pancake stay where you are do ye hear but harry seemed suddenly grown deaf and was now more than half out fixing his fingers very firmly on the ledge of the window and slowly dropping his legs downwards oh harry you will be killed screamed laura stop stop harry are you mad can nobody stop him but nobody could stop him for being so high above everybody's head harry had it all his own way and was now nearly hanging altogether out of the window but he stopped a single minute and called out do not be frightened laura i have behaved very ill and deserve the worst that can happen 
if i do break my head it will save mrs crabtree the trouble of breaking it for me after i come down the gardener now balanced himself steadily on the upper step of the ladder and spread his arms out while harry slowly let himself drop laura tried to look on without screaming out as that might have startled him but the scene became too frightful so she closed her eyes put her hands over her face and turned away while her heart beat so violently that it might almost have been heard even mrs crabtree clasped her hands in an agony of alarm while mrs darwin put up her pocket-handkerchief and could not look on another moment an awful pause took place during which a feather falling on the ground would have startled them when suddenly a loud shout from peter gray and the other children which was gaily echoed from the top of the ladder made laura venture to look up and there was harry safe in the gardener's arms who soon helped him down to the ground where he immediately asked pardon of everybody for the fright he had given them there was no time for more than half a scold from mrs crabtree as mrs darwin's car had been waiting some time so harry said she might be owing him the rest on some future occasion yes and a hundred lashes besides added peter gray laughing pray touch him up well mrs crabtree when you are about it there is no law against cruelty to boys this put mrs crabtree into such a rage that she followed peter with a perfect hailstorm of angry words till at last for a joke he put up mrs darwin's umbrella to screen himself and immediately afterwards the car drove slowly off when uncle david heard all the adventures at ivy lodge he listened most attentively to the confessions of master harry graham and shook his head in a most serious manner after they were concluded saying i have always thought that boys are like cats with nine lives at least you should be hung up in a basket harry as they do with unruly boys in the south sea islands where such young gentlemen as you are left dangling in the air for days together without a possibility of escape i would not care for that compared with being teased and worried by mrs crabtree i really wish uncle david that dr bell would order me never to be scolded any more it is very bad for me i generally feel an odd sort of over all ishness as soon as she begins and i am getting too big now for anything but a birch rod like frank how pleasant it is to be a grown-up man uncle david as you are sitting all day at the club with your hat on your head and nothing to do but look out of the window that is what i call happiness but once upon a time harry said lady harriet when i stopped in the carriage for your uncle david at the club he was in the middle of such a yawn at the window that he very nearly dislocated his jaw it was quite alarming to see him and he told me in a great secret that the longest and most tiresome hours of his life are when he has nothing particular to do now at this moment i have nothing particular to do said major graham therefore i shall tell you a wonderful story children about liking to be idle or busy and you must find out the moral for yourselves a story a story cried harry and laura in an ecstasy of delight and as they each had a knee of uncle david's which belonged to themselves they scrambled into their places exclaiming now let it be all about very bad boys and giants and fairies end of chapter eight chapter nine of holiday house this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rosalind walsh newfoundland and labrador canada holiday house by catherine sinclair chapter nine uncle david's nonsensical story about giants and fairies pie crust and pastry crust that was the wall the windows were made of black puddings and white and slated with pancakes you ne'er saw the like in the days of yore children were not all such clever good sensible people as they are now lessons were then considered rather a plague sugar plums were still in demand holidays continued yet in fashion 
and toys were not then made to teach mathematics nor story-books to give instruction in chemistry and navigation these were very strange times and there existed at that period a very idle greedy naughty boy such as we never hear of in the present day his papa and mamma were no matter who and he lived no matter where his name was master nobook and he seemed to think his eyes were made for nothing but to stare out of the windows and his mouth for no other purpose but to eat this young gentleman hated lessons like mustard both of which brought tears into his eyes and during school hours he sat gazing at his books pretending to be busy while his mind wandered away to wish impatiently for his dinner and to consider where he could get the nicest pies pastry ices and jellies while he smacked his lips at the very thoughts of them i think he must have been first cousin to peter gray but that is not perfectly certain whenever master nobook spoke it was always to ask for something and you might continually hear him say in a whining tone of voice papa may i take this piece of cake and sarah will you give me an apple mamma do send me the whole of that plum pudding indeed very frequently when he did not get permission to gormandize this naughty glutton helped himself without leave even his dreams were like his waking hours for he had often a horrible nightmare about lessons thinking that he was smothered with greek lexicons or pelted out of the school with a shower of english grammars while one night he fancied himself sitting down to devour an enormous plum cake and that all on a sudden it became transformed into a latin dictionary one afternoon master nobook having played truant all day from school was lolling on his mamma's best sofa in the drawing-room with his leather boots tucked up on the satin cushions and nothing to do but to suck a few oranges and nothing to think of but how much sugar to put upon them when suddenly an event took place which filled him with astonishment a sound of soft music stole into the room becoming louder and louder the longer he listened till at length in a few moments afterwards a large hole burst open in the wall of his room and there stepped into his presence two magnificent fairies just arrived from their castle in the air to pay him a visit they had travelled all the way on purpose to have some conversation with master nobook and immediately introduced themselves in a very ceremonious manner the fairy do-nothing was gorgeously dressed with a wreath of flaming gas round her head a robe of gold tissue a necklace of rubies and a bouquet in her hand of glittering diamonds her cheeks were rouged to the very eyes her teeth were set in gold and her hair was of a most brilliant purple in short so fine and fashionable looking a fairy never was seen in a drawing-room before the fairy teach all who followed next was simply dressed in white muslin with bunches of natural flowers in her light brown hair and she carried in her hand a few neat small books which master nobook looked at with a shudder of aversion the two fairies now informed him that they very often invited large parties of children to spend some time at their palaces but as they lived in quite an opposite direction it was necessary for their young guests to choose which it would be best to visit first therefore now they had come to inquire of master nobook whom he thought it would be most agreeable to accompany on the present occasion in my house said the fairy teach-all speaking with a very sweet smile and a soft pleasing voice you shall be taught to find pleasure in every sort of exertion for i delight in activity and diligence my young friends rise at seven every morning and amuse themselves with working in a beautiful garden of flowers rearing whatever fruit they wish to eat visiting among the poor associating pleasantly together studying the arts and sciences and learning to know the world in which they live and to fulfil the purposes for which they have been brought into it in short 
all our amusements tend to some useful object either for our own improvement or the good of others and you will grow wiser better and happier every day you remain in the palace of knowledge but in castle needless where i live interrupted the fairy do nothing rudely pushing her companion aside with an angry contemptuous look we never think of exerting ourselves for anything you may put your head in your pocket and your hands in your sides as long as you choose to stay no one is ever asked a question that he may be spared the trouble of answering we lead the most fashionable life that can be imagined for nobody speaks to anybody each of my visitors is quite an exclusive and sits with his back to as many of the company as possible in the most comfortable armchair that can be imagined there if you are only so good as to take the trouble of wishing for anything it is yours without even turning an eye round to look where it comes from dresses are provided of the most magnificent kind which go on of themselves without your having the smallest annoyance with either buttons or strings games which you can play without an effort of thought and dishes dressed by a french cook smoking hot and hot under your nose from morning till night while any rain we have is either made of cherry brandy lemonade or lavender water and in winter it generally snows iced punch for an hour during the forenoon nobody need be told which fairy master nobook preferred and quite charmed at his own good fortune in receiving so agreeable an invitation he eagerly gave his hand to the splendid new acquaintance who promised him so much pleasure and ease and gladly proceeded in a carriage lined with velvet stuffed with downy pillows and drawn by milk-white swans to that magnificent residence castle needless which was lighted by a thousand windows during the day and by a million of lamps every night here master nobook enjoyed a constant holiday and a constant feast while a beautiful lady covered with jewels was ready to tell him stories from morning till night and servants waited to pick up his playthings if they fell or to draw out his purse or his pocket handkerchief when he wished to use them thus master nobook lay dozing for hours and days on rich embroidered cushions never stirring from his place but admiring the view of trees covered with the richest burned almonds grottoes of sugar candy a jet d'eau of champagne a wide sea which tasted of sugar instead of salt and a bright clear pond filled with goldfish that let themselves be caught whenever he pleased nothing could be more complete and yet very strange to say master nobook did not seem particularly happy this appears exceedingly unreasonable when so much trouble was taken to please him but the truth is that every day he became more fretful and peevish no sweetmeats were worth the trouble of eating nothing was pleasant to play at and in the end he wished it were possible to sleep all day as well as all night not a hundred miles from the fairy do-nothing's palace there lived a most cruel monster called the giant snap em up who looked when he stood up like the tall steeple of a great church raising his head so high that he could peep over the loftiest mountains and was obliged to climb up a ladder to comb his own hair every morning regularly this prodigiously great giant walked round the world before breakfast for an appetite after which he made tea in a large lake used the sea as a slop basin and boiled his kettle on mount vesuvius he lived in great style and his dinners were most magnificent consisting very often of an elephant roasted whole ostrich patties a tiger smothered in onions stewed lions and whale soup but for a side dish his greatest favorite consisted of little boys as fat as possible fried in crumbs of bread with plenty of pepper and salt no children were so well fed or in such good condition for eating as those in the fairy do-nothing's garden who was a very particular friend of the great snap em ups and who sometimes laughingly said she would give him a license and call her own garden his preserve 
because she allowed him to help himself whenever he pleased to as many of her visitors as he chose without taking the trouble even to count them and in return for such extreme civility the giant very frequently invited her to dinner snap em up's favourite sport was to see how many brace of little boys he could bag in a morning so in passing along the streets he peeped into all the drawing-rooms without having occasion to get upon tiptoe and picked up every young gentleman who was idly looking out of the windows and even a few occasionally who were playing truant from school but busy children seemed always somehow quite out of his reach one day when master nobook felt even more lazy more idle and more miserable than ever he lay beside a perfect mountain of toys and cakes wondering what to wish for next and hating the very sight of everything and everybody at last he gave so loud a yawn of weariness and disgust that his jaw very nearly fell out of joint and then he sighed so deeply that the giant snap em up heard the sound as he passed along the road after breakfast and instantly stepped into the garden with his glass at his eye to see what was the matter immediately on observing a large fat overgrown boy as round as a dumpling lying on a bed of roses he gave a cry of delight followed by a gigantic peal of laughter which was heard three miles off and picking up master nobook between his finger and his thumb with a pinch that very nearly broke his ribs he carried him rapidly towards his own castle while the fairy do-nothing laughingly shook her head as he passed saying that little man does me great credit he has only been fed for a week and is as fat already as a prize ox what a dainty morsel he will be when do you dine to-day in case i should have time to look in upon you on reaching home the giant immediately hung up master nobook by the hair of his head on a prodigious hook in the larder having first taken some large lumps of nasty suet forcing them down his throat to make him become still fatter and then stirring the fire that he might be almost melted with heat to make his liver grow larger on a shelf quite near master nobook perceived the dead bodies of six other boys whom he remembered to have seen fattening in the fairy do-nothing's garden while he recollected how some of them had rejoiced at the thoughts of leading a long useless idle life with no one to please but themselves the enormous cook now seized hold of master nobook brandishing her knife with an aspect of horrible determination intending to kill him while he took the trouble of screaming and kicking in the most desperate manner when the giant turned gravely round and said that as pigs were considered a much greater dainty when whipped to death than killed in any other way he meant to see whether children might not be improved by it also therefore she might leave that great hog of a boy till he had time to try the experiment especially as his own appetite would be improved by the exercise this was a dreadful prospect for the unhappy prisoner but meantime it prolonged his life a few hours as he was immediately hung up again in the larder and left to himself there in torture of mind and body like a fish upon a hook the wretched boy began at last to reflect seriously upon his former ways and to consider what a happy home he might have had if he could only have been satisfied with business and pleasure succeeding each other like day and night while lessons might have come in as a pleasant sauce to his play hours and his play hours as a sauce to his lessons in the midst of many reflections which were all very sensible though rather too late master nobook's attention became attracted by the sound of many voices laughing talking and singing which caused him to turn his eyes in a new direction when for the first time he observed that the fairy teach-all's garden lay upon a beautiful sloping bank not far off there a crowd of merry noisy rosy-cheeked boys were busily employed and seemed happier than the day was long while poor master nobook watched them during his own miserable hours 
envying the enjoyment with which they raked the flower borders gathered the fruit carried baskets of vegetables to the poor worked with carpenter's tools drew pictures shot with bows and arrows played at cricket and then sat in the sunny arbors learning their tasks or talking agreeably together till at length a dinner bell having been rung the whole party sat merrily down with hearty appetites and cheerful good humour to an entertainment of plain roast meat and pudding where the fairy teach-all presided herself and helped her guests moderately to as much as was good for each large tears rolled down the cheeks of master nobook while watching this scene and remembering that if he had known what was best for him he might have been as happy as the happiest of these excellent boys instead of suffering ennui and weariness as he had done at the fairy do-nothings ending in a miserable death but his attention was soon after most alarmingly roused by hearing the giant snap em up again in conversation with his cook who said that if he wished for a good large dish of scalloped children at dinner it would be necessary to catch a few more as those he had already provided would scarcely be a mouthful as the giant kept very fashionable hours and always waited dinner for himself till nine o'clock there was still plenty of time so with a loud grumble about the trouble he seized a large basket in his hand and set off at a rapid pace towards the fairy teach-all's garden it was very seldom that snap em up ventured to think of foraging in this direction as he had never once succeeded in carrying off a single captive from the enclosure it was so well fortified and so bravely defended but on this occasion being desperately hungry he felt as bold as a lion and walked with outstretched hands straight towards the fairy teach-all's dinner-table taking such prodigious strides that he seemed almost as if he would trample on himself a cry of consternation arose the instant this tremendous giant appeared and as usual on such occasions when he had made the same attempt before a dreadful battle took place fifty active little boys bravely flew upon the enemy armed with their dinner knives and looked like a nest of hornets stinging him in every direction till he roared with pain and would have run away but the fairy teach-all seeing his intention rushed forward with the carving knife and brandishing it high over her head she most courageously stabbed him to the heart if a great mountain had fallen in the earth it would have seemed like nothing in comparison of the giant snap em up who crushed two or three houses to powder beneath him and upset several fine monuments that were to have made people remembered for ever but all this would have seemed scarcely worth mentioning had it not been for a still greater event which occurred on the occasion no less than the death of the fairy do-nothing who had been indolently looking on at this great battle without taking the trouble to interfere or even to care who was victorious but being also lazy about running away when the giant fell his sword came with so violent a stroke on her head that she instantly expired thus luckily for the whole world the fairy teach-all got possession of immense property which she proceeded without delay to make the best use of in her power in the first place however she lost no time in liberating master nobook from his hook in the larder and gave him a lecture on activity moderation and good conduct which he never afterwards forgot and it was astonishing to see the change that took place immediately in his whole thoughts and actions from this very hour master nobook became the most diligent active happy boy in the fairy teach-all's garden and on returning home a month afterwards he astonished all the masters at school by his extraordinary reformation the most difficult lessons were a pleasure to him he scarcely ever stirred without a book in his hand never lay on a sofa again would scarcely even sit on a chair with a back to it but preferred a three-legged stool detested holidays never thought any exertion a trouble preferred climbing over the top of a hill 
to creeping round the bottom, always ate the plainest food in very small quantities, joined a temperance society, and never tasted a morsel till he had worked very hard and got an appetite. Not long after this, an old uncle, who had formerly been ashamed of Master Nobuk's indolence and gluttony, became so pleased at the wonderful change that, on his death, he left him a magnificent estate, desiring that he should take his name. Therefore, instead of being any longer one of the Nobuk family, he is now called Sir Timothy Bluestocking, a pattern to the whole country round for the good he does to every one and especially for his extraordinary activity, appearing as if he could do twenty things at once, though generally very good-natured and agreeable, Sir Timothy is occasionally observed in a violent passion, laying about him with his walking-stick in the most terrific manner, and beating little boys within an inch of their lives, but on inquiry it invariably appears that he has found them out to be lazy, idle, or greedy, for all the industrious boys in the parish are sent to get employment from him, while he assures them that they are far happier breaking stones on the road than if they were sitting idly in a drawing-room with nothing to do. Sir Timothy cares very little for poetry in general, but the following are his favourite verses, which he has placed over the chimney-piece at a school that he built for the poor. And every scholar is obliged the very day he begins his education, to learn them. Some people complain they have nothing to do, and time passes slowly away. They saunter about with no object in view, and long for the end of the day. In vain are the trifles and toys they desire, for nothing they truly enjoy. Of trifles and toys and amusements they tire, for want of some useful employ. Although for transgression the ground was accursed, yet gratefully man must allow. T'was really a blessing which doomed him at first to live by the sweat of his brow. Nursery Rhymes Thank you a hundred times over, Uncle David, said Harry, when the story was finished. I shall take care not to be found hanging any day on a hook in the larder. Certainly, Frank, you must have spent a month with the good fairy, and I hope she will some day invite me to be made a scholar of too, for Laura and I still belong to the Nobuk family. It is very important, Harry, to choose the best course from the beginning, observed Lady Harriet. Good or bad habits grow stronger and stronger every minute, as if an additional string were tied on daily to keep us in the road where we walked the day before. So those who mistake the path of duty at first find hourly increasing difficulty in turning round. But, Grandmamma, said Frank, you have put up some finger-posts to direct us right, and whenever I see no passage this way, we shall wheel about directly. As Mrs. Crabtree has not tapped at the door yet, I shall describe the progress of a wise and a foolish man, to see which Harry and you would prefer copying, replied Lady Harriet, smiling. The fool begins when he is young with hating lessons, lying long in bed and spending all his money on trash. Any books he will consent to read are never about what is true or important, but he wastes all his time and thoughts on silly stories that never could have happened. Thus he neglects to learn what was done and thought, by all the great and good men who really lived in former times, while even his Bible, if he has one, grows dusty on the shelf. After so bad a beginning he grows up with no useful or interesting knowledge. Therefore his whole talk is to describe his own horses, his own dogs, his own guns, and his own exploits, boasting of what a high wall his horse can leap over the number of little birds he can shoot in a day, and how many bottles of wine he can swallow without tumbling under the table. Thus, glorying in his shame, he thinks himself a most wonderful person, not knowing that men are born to do much better things than merely to find selfish pleasure and amusement for themselves. Presently he grows old, gouty, and infirm, 
no longer able to do such prodigious achievements therefore now his great delight is to sit with his feet upon the fender at a club all day telling what a famous rider shooter and drinker he was long ago but nobody cares to hear such old stories therefore he is called a proser and every person avoids him it is no wonder a man talks about himself if he has never read or thought about any one else but at length his precious time has all been wasted and his last hour comes during which he can have nothing to look back upon but a life of folly and guilt he sees no one around who loves him or will weep over his grave and when he looks forward it is towards an eternal world which he has never prepared to enter and of which he knows nothing what a terrible picture grandmamma said frank rather gravely i hope there are not many people like that or it would be very sad to meet with them now pray let us have a pleasanter description of the sort of persons you would like harry and me to become the first foundation of all is as you already know frank to pray that you may be put in the right course and kept in it for of ourselves we are so sinful and weak that we can do no good thing then feeling a full trust in the divine assistance you must begin and end every day with studying your bible not merely reading it but carefully endeavouring to understand and obey what it contains our leisure should be bestowed on reading of wiser and better people than ourselves which will keep us humble while it instructs our understandings and thus we shall be fitted to associate with persons whose society is even better than books christians who are enlightened and sanctified in the knowledge of all good things will show us an example of carefully using our time which is the most valuable of all earthly possessions if we waste our money we may perhaps get more if we lose our health it may be restored but time squandered on folly must hereafter be answered for and can never be regained whatever be your station in life waste none of your thoughts upon fancying how much better you might have acted in some other person's place but see what duties belong to that station in which you live and do what that requires with activity and diligence when we are called to give an account of our stewardship let us not have to confess at the last that we wasted our one talent because we wished to have been trusted with ten but let us prepare to render up what was given to us with joy and thankfulness perfectly satisfied that the best place in life is where god appoints and where he will guide us to a safe and peaceful end yes added major graham you have two eyes in your minds as well as in your bodies with one of these we see all that is good or agreeable in our lot with the other we see all that is unpleasant or disappointing and you may generally choose which eye to keep open some of my friends always peevishly look at the troubles and vexations they endure but they might turn them into good by considering that every circumstance is sent from the same hand with the same merciful purpose to make us better now and happier hereafter well my dear children said lady harriet it is time now for retiring to bedfordshire so good night if you please grandmamma not yet asked harry anxiously give us five minutes longer and then in the morning you will want to remain five minutes more in bed that is the way people learn to keep such dreadfully late hours at last harry i knew one very rich old gentleman formerly who always wished to sit up a little later every night and to get up a little later in the morning till at length he ended by hiring a set of servants to rise at nine in the evening as he did himself and to remain in bed all day people should regulate their sleep very conscientiously added major graham so as to waste as little time as possible and our good king george the third set us the example for he remarked that six hours in the night were quite enough for a man seven hours for a woman and eight for a fool or perhaps harry you might like to live by sir william jones rule six hours to read 
to soothing slumber seven ten to the world a lot and all to heaven end of chapter nine